Huh? Yeah. Okay. We're going to get started. Welcome everybody to the twice monthly meeting of the Mayor and Council of the City of Westminster. Um, if you have an electronic device, uh, please silence it for the duration of the meeting. Uh, at our courtesy to others. Um, we will start the meeting as we always do with a pledge to the flag and a moment of silence. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We'll get right to it. We have uh, two items for approval on the minutes. Uh, the first is the mayor and council meeting of May 14th, 2018, and the second is the executive session of May 14th, 2018. Make a motion to approve the minutes. Well, I guess I'd better second it, should I? I certainly hope so. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any uh, corrections, amendments, deletions? All right, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, minutes are approved. Next is a public hearing um, in the city of Westminster. Public hearings are administered by the mayor. Mr. Mayor, the gavel is yours. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right. <clears throat> Again, public hearing ordinance number 895, an ordinance regarding uh, local zoning map amendment number LMA 18-01, approving an application for the establishment of medical cannabis overlay district upon certain property located in the city's B business zone and adopting the accompanying written decision. Mr. Mackey. Thank you, sir. Uh, the public hearing you're about to hear is regarding the cannabis dispensary proposed for location at 330 140 Lillard Road. On October 26, 2013, the Mayor Council passed and approved Ordinance 859, which created a process for the review and approval of medical cannabis uses in the city of Westminster. Uh, this includes the standards for licensed dispensary premises, and we set forth a packet and attached for reference. If approved, the city would only apply this medical uh, cannabis use zone to tenant spaces, Unit 7 and Unit 8, for the specific proposed dispensary and its application. Any other medical cannabis proposal would require a separate on April 12th, 2018, your Planning and Zoning Commission held a public hearing to receive public comments and a presentation by the petitioner. Uh, the commissioner voted to leave the public record open for 20 days to receive additional comments. Uh, on April 27th, the commission did receive a letter from Ms. Stephanie Brophy of the Lady Curtis Beach uh, LLP and an updated graphic representation of security measures with the only additional materials that I received. On May 10th, the commission uh, deliberated and voted to approve the petition as submitted. Uh, the public record has been submitted uh, for your review in your packets. Uh, I just want to note that as part of the process to apply for a floating zone, uh, the Mayor and Common Council could choose to grant conditional approval of the zone for a dispensary depending on the petitioner's successful licensure by the state for this particular facility. Uh, your Planning and Zoning Commission has recommended approval the commission's report and recommendation is attached. Staff recommends that the mayor and common council hold the public hearing tonight, then vote to continue the hearing on July 9th at 6 p.m. at City Hall. Certainly so here to answer any questions at this time and also um, the ordinance related to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do uh, the members of the council have any questions for Mr. Mackey? Okay. We are going to open this up for public comment, and we have um, two people have signed the public comment uh, list. Uh, when you uh, make your comment, please state your name and your address before speaking. And first up is Deborah. Good job. Good job. Yeah, please stand, say your name and your address. And Good afternoon, I'm Deborah Pujols. I am in, live in 347 Kirk Avenue. As I stated before in, my, in the last public hearing also, I am not opposed to the medical cannabis, but I'm opposed to the location. I do not believe that it's a secure, even though they said that they follow, will follow strict measures of security, there's always the possibility. The location is not good for that. Um, also, I do believe that if said and approved is a matter of time when 
legal is when marijuana can be legalized in the future and food for thought will be that the first places that could be accepted to sell it later on will also be the ones that have already been certified and approved <coughs> for medical marijuana. That is also one reason, another reason that I strongly oppose to the location. It should be on a better place, in the place that it could be for medical attentions, for doctors and everything, buildings that are safer. There is a building also in the corner of, um, when you enter 97, there's um, a medical facilities everywhere there. So it should be placed on a location like that. I, like I said, I don't agree with that. I know that it would be beneficial for several people because they're sick and they're needing it, but that is not the location to put it. That's the only, the only thing that I disagree upon. I mentioned my statement in the past, and I understand it and I agree upon doing it. But it's not a service for the community, it's a service for the people that are sick and are needing it. And people that are sick go to doctors, hospitals, and medical locations, buildings and locations, and that's where it should be, on a safer place, secure, and surrounding, you know, surrounded by medical doctors and everywhere else. It, it should be approved. So, that's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, again, please state your name and your address before speaking. You have, uh, Luis Tapia? Okay. All right, is there anybody else that would like to make public comment before we close the comments? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, we're going to leave it open. We're leaving, we're leaving it open until the next meeting. Um, any um, council members? Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, we had anticipated making a small presentation. I'm here on behalf of actually my mail LLC, the applicant. And if we have an opportunity right now, it probably won't be more than, you know, 15 minutes. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. That's fine. So, Stephanie Brophy of Delaney Leahy Curtis and Beach on behalf of My Bond LLC, the applicant. And with me is Ron Bond of My Bond LLC. So, we're here, as Mr. Mackey said, stated requesting that the mayor and council uh, uh, vote to adopt an ordinance applying the Medical Cannabis Overlay District to 330 140 Village Road Unit 7 and 8. It's the shopping center where it's the actual place where a muscle mine gym used to be in a blue bistro. And okay, so we know where it is. And as this body knows, the purpose of the Medical Cannabis Overlay District is to implement state law with regards to the location of the facility for the processing, growing, and dispensing of medical cannabis to qualified patients who are legally entitled to have it available. And obviously it's to do so in a manner that we have the appropriate restrictions and conditions in place that the zoning is what it should be and the potential adverse consequences to the neighborhood and the businesses <coughs> are minimized. Here, the mayor and common council has already designated this area within the district, so it's presumptively appropriate. Um, to that end, I think it is <coughs> to have Mr. Bond, who knows far more about it than his attorney, answer a few questions about the facility, the process, and the security. Um, if we could walk through some of that, because we do hear the public, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but I do hear you, um, but the measures in the state of Maryland are so high, the security uh, restrictions on these facilities, that there, there seems to be much less of a risk of any sort of, um, sort of, uh, if any in-house inventory would somehow become subject to theft or anything of that sort. So, um, Mr. Bond, what is your relationship to my Bond LLC? Uh, I'm one of the co-founders. Okay, and did you apply for a medical cannabis dispensary license from the state of Maryland? Yes. And was My Bond LLC approved for a pre-approval license? Yes, My Bond LLC uh, received stage one. Okay, and were you required to undergo criminal a criminal background investigation? Yes. And were you required to undergo financial disclosures? Yes. Okay. And what is the role of a dispensary agent at a medical cannabis dispensary? Uh, the dispensary agent is the one who actually handles the product and provides it to a qualified. And are those dispensary agents subject to a full background check and drug screening? Yes. Okay, and are they, does the state of Maryland require that they receive substantial training in the handling of medical cannabis? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to show you, and 
I'm going to give each of you a copy. This is the floor plan, and I think it's helpful because the floor plans actually show the amount of security cameras. That th this is all required by the state. I would love to say that this is 100% voluntary by my uh, client. I'm sure they would anyway, but this is the state requirements are very, very strict for these facilities. And I can get it apart. <coughs> and I will show you one here. So if you can hang on to that. <coughs> so can you describe the um, overall construction of the premises with regards to the additional measures that are placed here to prevent unauthorized entry? Yes, so to, just to give you guys a little bit of an overview, um, the, the facility has to be divided into a public zone and a private zone. Um, the public zone is open to the public, that's designated in yellow. Um, the blue is the service area, that area is restricted by um, key cards and we have to log everyone that goes in and out. Um, and only employees or registered dispensary agents employees and <coughs> qualifying patients are allowed into that blue area. And then behind that, there's the green area, and no member of the public is allowed in there unless escorted by a registered dispensary agents. So the only people who go back in there, just where all the product was stored, are the actual employees of the facility. Um, in addition, uh, as far as security requirements, um, we have to have two entirely separate security systems, one for the building itself, and then one for the secure room and packaging area. They can't even, they can't share power, they can't share cameras, they can't share storage, everything has to be totally <clears throat> Will you describe the doors to the secure room? Um, to the, okay, so actually let's start with the secure room. The secure room has to be constructed of reinforced concrete um, on all four sides of the ceiling. Um, it has to have metal doors and badge locks and, and the whole nine to secure that area. And all of the product has to be stored in that room except for an hour before we open, while we're open, and an hour after we close. So we got to pack everything up every day and stick it into that secure area. Okay. And will you describe the security system that you're required to have in place? Um, briefly, it's, uh, uh, so it's two separate systems, um, one for the, the public and service area and then one for the, the green secure areas. Um, it has to be 100% camera coverage throughout the entire thing. All the recordings have to be stored off-site with timestamps and I mean, there's a, a, a lot of security requirements around that. And also in the event when, uh, if we discover that maybe some product has been converted or if we have a break-in or something, that we're required to disclose that to Maryland State Police within 24 hours. So and you talked about there being a public area and then a service area. Yes. Who has access to the service area? Uh, the service area, normally it is only employees. Um, members of the public who are coming in to receive product, they have to check in into the waiting area and then they have to be escorted into the service area by them. And those people who come in and represent that they are uh, a qualified patient entitled to receive medical cannabis, what do they have to show you? Um, <clears throat> there are, uh, uh, they can request an ID card, but that's not required because we have to have a real-time connection back to the Medical Cannabis Commission to verify every patient every time they come in that they are currently good standing with the commission. So the state of Maryland actually is tied into your system, so any person who walks through there, it's fed to the state of Maryland? Yes as well as every, um, any sort of product that comes in has to be logged with the state, and any sort of product that goes out the door has to be logged with the state. Okay, and on this um, floor plan layout, I see a, a number of video cameras. So will it be 24 hour surveillance? Yes, 24 hour surveillance. Okay, and where will the records of these images be kept? Uh, there will be one copy stored locally and another copy stored off site. Okay. And so you talked about security when you are having products shipped in or delivered. Speak specifically to this site, right? If you're having it delivered, how will you keep it secure? Um, <clears throat> well, before the product even leaves the processor or the grower, um, they have to send us an electronic manifest with the contents of what they will be delivering to us. Um, and basically we have an entrance directly into the secure area from the rear of the building. So we anticipate loading and unloading through there, which will, can only be done by qualified employees or the employee of approximately how many employees when this business is up and running do you anticipate having? Um, on a daily basis, uh, it, it depends on the number of patients. Um, at the moment, we're planning on these 10. And so, just remind me, who will actually handle the medical, medical cannabis product? 
Uh, they have to be what's known as a registered dispensary agent, so they undergo a criminal background check with the state. They are certified by the state, um, and they are the only ones that are, are allowed to be in any of the secure areas of the facility. And any patient that comes in is escorted on a one-to-one -one basis by one of these dispensary agents. Are qualified patients, they're entitled to use medical cannabis, can they use it in the facility? Absolutely not. Um, no, no products can be consumed. Where is the only place that a qualified patient is legally allowed to use the product? In their home. Okay. Um, how will you handle the receipt, receipt, storage, packaging, and labeling? You receive a delivery of medical cannabis at this location. What will occur once it goes into your facility? Um, we have to verify every item that matches with the electronic manifest, at which point we provide a real-time update to the state that says, yes, we have received the contents of this. If there's any discrepancy, we send the whole thing back and they have to start all over. Have you yourself visited other medical cannabis dispensaries currently operating in Maryland? Yes, I have. And can you describe what their operations are like? Um, generally, uh, they are similar to what we're doing here. Um, you come in, there's a waiting area. Some are very expensive and sell like assorted products. Some are very sparse and it's basically a closet sized waiting room. You come in, you check in with the receptionist, you provide your identification, and then an agent comes out of the secure area, escorts you into the secure area where the product's dispensed. You, uh, you, know, you work with them, you get whatever you need, everything is packaged in you know, very clean packaging and it goes out the door sealed. And in your interactions with the people, the other medical cannabis dispensaries, have they indicated that there has been any issues with um, public, who are public people who are not qualified patients coming in and attempting to obtain medical cannabis? No, I've not heard of any, anything like that. Okay. And currently, what, are, what, what stage are you at with the state of Maryland? Uh, currently, we have received what's known as stage one approval, which means uh, we had to fill out it's about a 140 page application, basically describing exactly how we were going to run the operation and structure our business. Based on that, they gave us the stage one approval, which means that we can now go and build what we said we were going to build in our application. So once this is approved, then we will have to go through construction for the site, and then this site will actually be physically inspected by the Medical Cannabis Commission, at which point, Assuming we pass muster, they will grant us what's known as stage two approval and then we'll be able to be open for business. How do you confirm that a prescription is valid? Somebody could be a qualified patient and then for the prescription. How do you confirm it? No, because the, uh, the prescriptions are also registered with the state. The doctors have to be registered, the patients have to be registered, and if the doctor has certified that patient, then that is on file with the state of Maryland. But again, we check in real time when the patient comes through the door. Okay, and does this facility have public water and sewer? Yes. Um, you are familiar with the extensive regulations concerning medical cannabis, and you've spoken about many of them today. Will you comply uh, with all such rules and regulations concerning a medical cannabis dispensary? Yes, absolutely. And will you conspicuously display your medical cannabis dispensary license? Yes, absolutely. Um, assuming that this, you are, assuming the Mayor and Common Council votes to approve the adoption of an ordinance applying the medical cannabis overlay district to this facility, approximately when would you anticipate actually being open for business? Uh, we are anticipating about 60 days for construction after approval. Um, if that happens tonight, that puts us uh, the end of August, early September. And are you intending on using very basic nondescript signage? Yes, absolutely. Uh, most of the other ones I've been to have been very... And are they in a variety of locations? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I would um, open it up for some questions and I would do a short closing if you don't have any questions. Mr. President, I've got, or actually, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, you run the hearings. Got a couple questions. So first, I don't think we're going to give an approval tonight or take a vote on it because you didn't have enough time um, on the notification. So I believe we have to move this to our subsequent meeting. You mentioned if you get approval tonight. I, I don't believe that's gonna happen. Am I right, Ms. Levin? That's correct. Yes, there is okay. a question of the length of the posting of the signage. You're, you're aware of that? We are aware. Okay. I was just stating in general so that I didn't have to do this again for you. The next yeah. time you see me, <laughs> well, I was more I responding one to shot the, you would have. Yeah. Remember that. Okay. We just have to leave public comment open until the next right. meeting. Right. Yeah. So, and, and uh, are you aware that we've already been through this once? We've yes. already given one approval. Um, so, I guess there's enough business here for two of you to operate within the city, you think? One question. You mentioned that they don't have to have an ID card, which I was under the impression they did, in order to be able to be dispensed the, the product. 
So how are you going to identify them if they're not going to have an ID card? Uh, if they don't have an ID card, they have to provide a state ID, a driver's license, or something like that, at which point we can check in real time with the okay. Kansas Commission. So you do, you, you, that was not mentioned in your question and answer period, so you do intend to check some form of identification? Yeah, absolutely, we're required to. Um, and the reason is because of the cards, um, the state charges 50 bucks for them, so they don't, uh, they don't make people buy them. I was not aware of that. I thought they had to have them. Okay. I, I think that's all the questions I have, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I can ask that's a question. Um, the red perimeter on the um, secure area, the green secure area, is that also a reinforced concrete wall, or is that just denoting the, the secure area? Uh, that's just denoting the secure area. Um, the, the reinforced concrete is only required for the secure room, again, because that's where all the product is stored. When we're not and you mentioned that, that it's also uh, the roof of the secure room is also concrete? As far as I know, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so even though this is actually, you know, obviously we share a wall with uh, the people next door at this place, yes, we have, right. to, have to be totally secure in that room. Okay. Um, and then, uh, is it on slab? Like, so does the concrete wall go down to slab? I'm just thinking of other ways people could break into the secure room. <laughs> Out loud, I'm in public. So you think if I could just jump in, I mean, these are very detailed requirements that this application was done some time ago that we could certainly, I could provide a written supplementation if you'd like to know specifically on the concrete. I'm sure I have it in here, yep. but he probably wouldn't remember the specific constructive requirements of the state of Maryland. They're very specific. So okay. if you would like, I'd be happy to supplement. Yeah, that'd be great. Just um, because I remember the last time we got into a fairly detailed discussion about the, the Details, okay. yeah. So, are you thinking about that for your grandkids? Or <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just you know, I think that the, the concerns about the security of the, the, the inventory are relevant, and uh, so just making sure. And this is a different kind of building than the other building. This is a strip mall that's got you know high ceilings and. So I was pleased to hear that it's going to have a, a concrete roof because that was going to be one of my other questions is that it's easy to go over partitions in those kinds of buildings, you know, because there's open duct work and open spaces above the, the drop ceilings typically. So um, that would be uh, an important thing. And then the, on the uh, doors, the access controls are what? Uh, Still working that out with the contractor, we expect to use a badge system Bad because readers. again, everyone that goes through any door that yep. has to be logged and ready yep. to be yep. maintained for some period of time. Okay. And what is an IDF? IDF closet. Um, honestly, I don't know what IDF stands for, but it's, it's, our, like it's our tech room. Um, it's where uh, oh information, will be. data, facilities, probably yeah. or something. So where the telecom yeah. stuff terminates and yep. network connections. Okay, um, and those external walls in the security area, again, you, you, in any, any other details you can give about the, the perimeter of the security area, what it's constructed of, that Absolutely. sort of thing. Absolutely, I would will be, supplement. You, you know, the secure room and just the secure area generally. Um, and I think that was, those were my only questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So um, the exit to grade in the back, those those are the doors as well that you're referencing. That will be a key badge. Oh yes. Yeah. For the for the exit to grade, the two doors that are out there, and um, just to follow up, just to remind me for the secure the secure room has to be a standalone like that standalone room with no exterior walls, no windows, well, and no, no exterior windows, windows or no exterior right. windows and things like that. Um, and so there's no issue that that abuts up right next to an existing other business? No, we, uh, we confirmed that with the commission because that was okay. one of our questions as well. Okay. As long as we're totally concrete inside, okay. we're okay with it. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I had one more question Sounds I neglected good. to ask. Do you intend to sell other paraphernalia in the facility outside of the product itself? Um, only what is related to the delivery of cannabis. I mean, we're not, we're not looking to open a head shop, but we want to offer some product. Thank you. Mr. President, as far as I know, um, this, this is a powerlifting strong engine before this, mm -hmm. and the floors are slab. Okay. Um, so as long as the walls are going down to that, uh, that should answer that question. Uh, the only question that I have 
is you mentioned uh, security, the, the cameras, that there'll be an on-site and off-site. Um, does that happen in real time, or is it uploaded at night? Um, that still to be determined. I don't have an answer. The, the reason I ask is if someone, you know, someone breaks in and there's a, a NAS or wherever it's being uh, stored, and that's taken, and it's uh, like a nightly backup at 3 a.m. or something, which is a typical way to do it. I'm pretty sure that, again, I have to refer back to the statute. I'm pretty sure we do have to offload them. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to supplement on that issue as well, but I'm, I'm pretty positive there is a real-time requirement for the sensors, for the security. Okay. Mm, sorry, just one other question. Sure. Sorry. So your exit to grade doors again, and I know we sort of talked about the fact. So you have two exit to grade doors, one from the secure area and one from the public waiting area. Are those doors batched the same to get in they from will. the outside? The, okay. Those are both they're like steel doors. So okay. They're not, we're not planning to use it as a public entrance. Okay. All right. and, that, and so the one for the security area is really just for delivery yeah. of product into the back. Is there parking back there? I don't think so. I think it's just like a, an access road. Okay. Um, the dumpster's back there. Do you, do you know, is yeah, there parking back it's there? An, it's an alley. I okay. mean, you, you could. Does that alley terminate at the end of your building? Because you're well on that corner alley. lot. No, no, it actually goes all the way around. Oh, the so back. it goes, continues around behind Blue Bistro, down past mm -hmm. what? Yeah, Avenaris is in there or something like it that. It goes behind the, all the entire L. The best building should look in L, so the entire. Okay. So that alley goes the whole way back beyond there. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anybody have any other uh, questions? Brief closing. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, bear, bear, bear with me. I have to earn my keep. <laughs> Okay, so we would submit that the petition for map amendment and zoning ordinance that they have applied for meets all requirements within the City of Westminster Code. Although there have been some public comments from citizens, which we do appreciate, we don't think that there has been any evidence offered to support that this location is not an appropriate location where it is located. It is actually um, within the district that's already been approved by the Mayor and Common Council. It is actually safe in this location. It's not isolated. It's within an existing business use shopping center. It is surrounded by business owned properties. Um, it is safe off the Main Street thoroughfare, 140 Village Road. It's a very safe road, two stop signs. There's a lot of activity there, which is actually a good thing. It's nondescript signage. This is actually for legalized for people who are legally entitled to obtain it so there's no requirement in the state of maryland that's requiring that we put this in a medical office building or we put this here we actually want it accessible to people access you don't want to create some perception that this is um, a bad thing or that we should be scared of it we should say this is super secure this is part of it and if you're only qualified is the way you get in the the land use characteristics the, the footprints we would analogize to a pharmacy just like you have a right aid in the middle of another shopping center right but you have a lot more to buy to write it. People go in, they show a prescription, they get vetted, are you who you said you are? Are you entitled to this prescription? You go through the process, you get your prescription, and you leave. The difference is, this is even more strict. You leave, you can't take the pill in the car, you need to go home and do it. I mean, this is very strict, but we would submit that it is not going to have a bigger, a bigger footprint than a, a simple pharmacy. We would submit it actually is going to have less. Um, the only legalized area for consumption, as we talked about before, is in one's residence. Um, there's no evidence submitted or that we've been aware of that patients of the dispensary will cause any dis disturbance or having a dispensary in a shopping center will somehow cause a dis disturbance to the surrounding business community or even the homes. This facility we didn't bring up, but it is located beyond a thousand feet from a school, which is one of the requirements in the state of Maryland. Um, the security required by the state is very high and will protect any inventory in set on site, which is why the state of Maryland has been so conservative with their regulations. And I think it's important to note that the applicant will actually risk going to jail if they don't dispense this product in conformity with Maryland law. That's a pretty big stick um, to keep people in check. So we would actually submit this is a perfect location for it. It's on the other side, right, of the city. It's far away, it's perfect, easy accessibility to people. Um, small enough community, well lit, the security measures will increase um, and the security room will prevent some of the, um, I guess, some of the fears that people um, are speaking of, and for all these reasons, we would ask that when the time is appropriate, you do vote to approve the um, adoption of an ordinance applying the medical cannabis overlay district to 330, 140 Village Road, Unit 7 and 8. We would submit on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to be leaving the public comments uh, open. Um, so we need a motion and a approval for that, I believe. Not yet. But we will. 
Yeah, we'll, uh, well, I'll check with Melissa whether we introduce tonight and we put that on until after the public hearing is closed. Okay. Well, All right. Bang of the gavel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next item, oh, before we get to that, I'm sorry, I blew right past. Uh, we have a visitor here uh, from the Boy Scouts. Um, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself and your troop and why you're here. I'm Dylan Harris from Troop 420. It's run by St. John's. And uh, I'm here in order to get my citizenship and community members because I'm extremely close to being a scout. All right. Congratulations on the impending Eagle Scout. Um, you, you, you don't have. Well, I guess you have to stay for the whole meeting. You do whatever you want. You can come and go as you please. If you if if, you, if it just gets painfully boring. Okay. We're not offended if people come and go. So you don't you don't have to stay for the whole thing. Whatever you guys want. All right. So our next item is the consent calendar. We have. Five items on the consent calendar. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the consent calendar. Make a motion to approve the consent calendar, Mr. President. I'll second that. Motion to second. Any discussion or questions from staff about any of the items on the consent calendar? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, Mr. Mayor, reports from the mayor. All right, just a couple things uh, I'd like to talk about. So this week we uh, attended, some of us attended the um, Retirement reception for Miss Sandy Ox of the Carroll Arts Council and the Carroll Arts Center. Um, she will be sorely, sorely missed. Uh, she received the key to the city, uh, which is the first time I've given the key to the city to anyone. And uh, as far as our records show, you find the first time possible anyone's got the key to the city. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe uh, a past mayor in the audience can correct me later if that's not the case. But um, <laughs> it was exciting to give it to her. It was uh, she's going to be she's she's done a lot for the for the for the city and the county. Uh, she still is doing a lot for the city, even though she's uh, got one foot out of the door. And I just uh, think it was uh, it'd only be fair to mention her here today. Um, the other thing uh, was the beer and barbecue stroll, which was a great success. I think uh, the numbers we last uh, saw. Yeah, I was just checking just to make sure. Um, were around 7,000 uh, attendees, uh, which. Uh, I, you know, I was at the, the, the stroll last year and this year, and I had a good time last year. And this year it was many times better in my opinion. It, it just keeps improving. I feel like all the strolls have, and um, you know, it's a good service that, that we offer not just for our city, but it brings people in from all over the place. I know I ran into probably 50 people that I knew that don't live in city limits, and that's a really good thing. Um, because I know when we go, we always stay and we, we patronize other businesses downtown afterwards. And it was a, it was a very, very good event. And, um, and that'd be it, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next item is reports from standing committees. Uh, Dr. Becker, anything? Um, just follow up very quickly on the mayor's um, recognition of Sandy Ox. Um, it was a really fantastic reception uh, at the Art Center and she was very <coughs> supply, surprised and honored by everything that I think uh, the city had presented her with. Um, and nothing else to report. All right. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Um, Councilman Kavachi. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, two items from the Public Safety Committee. Number one, um, I'd just like to compliment the chief and his staff. I'm sure everyone probably has already had an opportunity to read the Carroll County Times today, but uh, the chief and his staff were the first police department in the entire state of Maryland to successfully complete the one mind uh, certification, which was no small fat, small feat. It, 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 it required some effort to do that. Obviously, it took effort because they're the only ones that have done it in the entire state so far. And uh, I, I think most of us would agree it's, it's incredibly important that our police officers are well trained and capable of dealing with people who are in mental uh, um, distress. Yeah, me mental distress um, and are having mental issues. Um, I've seen it firsthand um, in the community where police officers have uh, come and helped a young lady that was clearly in, in serious distress and I was just blown away by the, the level of professionalism and, and obvious training that they had in dealing with this, this woman. Um, and diffused the situation and didn't turn it into a what could have been a much worse situation. And, and I know that happens almost every day here in the city or certainly numerous times a week. And this kind of certification and training, I think, speaks to the, 
incredibly high level uh, that our department is, is functioning at. You know, we are not a giant department like some of these other agencies that have resources and, and money to put into things like this, yet here we are, 44 man, 45 man department, and we're the first ones in the state to accomplish it. So, Chief, I'm very proud of you and, and the staff. I hope you will pass it along. I think, uh, I think it's a big deal and, a, and quite a great accomplishment. So please Thanks, make sir. sure you pass okay. that on. Um, secondly, I'd like to comment, um, or actually discuss briefly, the Public Safety Advisory Council uh, had um, commissioned a survey. I think most of you are aware the survey is complete. The results um, are in a raw format in, and I think we were very successful in, in, in getting the results of the survey. Now we are going to try to refine the information and boil it down to a presentation that the, uh, the group can bring back to uh, this body and make a presentation as to what um, what those survey results said. Um, and then I think it will be incumbent upon us to take that information and make our policy decisions um, based upon that, um, as needed. I, I don't think we're necessarily expecting something from this body, but certainly I think it's uh, a, a valuable piece of information that we're going to be able to then utilize in the future. Um, and a lot of work and time and effort went into it. Um, so I'll have that. Uh, one other thing, National Light Out is coming up. Chief, that's it's August, <coughs> August, what day? August 7th. So we'll meet again before then so we can bring it up. But um, it's always nice. I, I know I get out every year and go to it. I think a few of you have as well in the past year. So it's good to get out in the community and, and let folks see us out there along with the senior staff members. Um, and the chief will make arrangements for each of us to be hooked up with a senior member to we go around with them to the different event locations. So maybe put that on your calendar um, if you have an opportunity to get out there and do it. That's all I have, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman Crosby. Councilman Yingling. Yeah, from the Public Works Committee, I'd like to report back on uh, Mayor Dominic and uh, Councilman Pecorero and I uh, meeting at Maryland Municipal League. We uh, had the opportunity to sit down with Secretary Grumbles again. Uh, he, this is obviously in relation to the need to find new water sources. He walked into the room and looked at both of us and said, Team Water Reuse from Westminster, Maryland. Uh, that's, that's, a major, that's a major deal in my opinion. Also, right after that meeting, uh, I got another minute to speak to the governor. And he asked me about how we were doing with the water reuse and I informed him that we had just met with Secretary Grumbles and he informed me that if we needed anything to please let his office know. So I believe we are in a very strong position to make uh, some headway. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the delegation for you know understanding what's going on here and supporting us. Thanks to Mayor Dominic for being involved, Councilman, I mean Councilwoman Becker. <laughs> Uh, I'm very positively optimistic and I know that we have steps uh, that we're taking to meet with the governor, I mean, I'm sorry, meet with Secretary Grumbles again and his legislative aid. So that's a big, uh, it was worth get, going down there just for that among a lot of other things. So that is all I have, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman Yingling. If, uh but that's awesome, and uh, that will be a major achievement if we can get uh, a water reuse project up and running to both be a demonstration for the rest of the state and the country, but also to, that is the path forward for increasing our capacity of our system. So c congratulations. That sounds like a, a, a very successful uh, meeting, set of meetings. So good job. Um, I have a couple items um, to share. Uh, first, I will... It was broken heart. It's probably too strong, but uh, very disappointing not to have been able to go to the barbecue and beer show. We were at the beach, and the beach was fun. And I also missed uh, Sandy's thing, which I wanted to be at. But um, the other thing is uh, next uh, on Saturday, July seventh, will be our first Pride Festival here in Westminster. Uh, um, Birdie's Cafe is been a major um, organizer of this and um, it's going to be a 
a, a, a big celebration of the diversity that this community has always had. And um, so it, I think it's very appropriate to publicly acknowledge that. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And then uh, well, this past weekend, we had uh, another Corbett's Charge celebration. Um, this is probably now, what, 15 years? 15 years, geez. Uh, Corbett's Charge was, a, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, was a Civil War battle that occurred right here in uh, Westminster. Um, played a, a very important role in the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Jeb Stewart brought his cavalry up right by Maggie's up Washington Road there. And at the intersection of um, Washington Road and East Main Street, they were met by a small troop of the 1st Delaware Cavalry that was camped up at McDaniel College on the campus. And they came down Main Street, they had a battle there, and the first, uh, the, the Union Cavalry was defeated pretty quickly, but it was enough of a delay that Jeb Stewart spent the night in Westminster, which added another day of delay for him to arrive at Gettysburg, which some, many historians believe was a pivotal factor in the Confederate defeat at Gettysburg. And ultimately the Confederate loss in the war. And ultimately the Confederate loss in the war. So uh, that happened this weekend. Um, it was another successful uh, commemoration. We have the encampment uh, right here on City Hall grounds. And uh, the Pipe Creek Civil War Roundtable is one of the organizations that is a, a key um, sponsor of this. And um, they, one of their members was a gentleman named uh, Dr. Tom Lagore. And he passed away last year. And um, Tom was, uh, you know, we weren't super close, but I, I knew him well. Uh, he was one of the people that came to the city way back, uh, you know, in 2003 to start this commemoration going, as well as uh, Rebecca Ornstein, who was a former council member. Um, and their, their combined efforts, we got this thing going, and it's been going great ever since. So Tom passed away. This is a picture of Tom at a prior event. Um, and uh, the Pike... Pipe Creek Civil War Roundtable has established a um, put that up there um, a scholarship in commemoration of Tom's uh, role commemorating the Civil War. And there's a brief description here of the, of the George Thomas Tom Lagore Memorial Scholarship. Tom Lagore's passion was the Civil War. He enjoyed many years of being a Civil War historian and reenactor. Tom was the author of the book Just South of Gettysburg, which can be can be regarded as an expert record of Carroll County's role within the Civil War. Tom was active with the Maryland Heart of the Civil War Heritage Area, Union Mills Homestead, the Pipe Creek Civil War Roundtable, and was a driving force in the creation of the annual Corbett's Charge Anniversary Commemoration event. This scholarship is named in his memory because of his great contributions to preserving Civil War history within Carroll County, Maryland. Um, so this is a, a, a scholarship that's held over at the Community Foundation and high school students can apply each year. The requirement is that it any high school student residing in Her Carroll County, they have to write a 2,000 word essay on a subject relating to Carroll County Civil War history or the importance of preserving Civil War history, and then the student shall provide a copy of their high school transcript. And it's an annual thing. Each year, th they will be offering multiple scholarships. Um, so I just want to pass that along and uh, recognize the Pipe Creek Civil War Roundtable and the Historical Society and all the other groups that were um, contributed to yet another successful Corbett's Charge commemoration. And then the last item is um, today I became a um, happy gigabit fiber customer of, from the Westminster Fiber Network. Uh, the Ting folks were at my house today and installed my equipment. The drop went in last week while I was on vacation. And um, I gotta say, it's, it's working. It's, it's an amazing thing, the difference it makes. And um, but the, the point of bringing this up is not that I'm a gigabit customer, although I'm very happy about that. Uh, the two installers, uh, after they did their work and they did all their the stuff that they're supposed to do, made a point to say to me uh, to thank the city for embarking on this project because if we hadn't, they would have both been stuck in jobs they hated. And uh, one of them worked in um, retail, and the other worked in a lab. And both of them loved their jobs. And um, it was just a, a real poignant reminder to me that 
um, the whole point of doing this was economic development and that these two guys now have jobs they love and have great career prospects as a result of the project. And it was just a perfect anecdote of an example of, of the success of that aspect of it. Um, so there you have it. Jealous. <laughs> You'll get it. Uh, You'll get it. It's coming. I'll get it within a week. All right. Um, any other council comments and discussion? Hearing none, we're on to bids. We have one bid approval, sewage sludge removal for the wastewater treatment plant, Mr. Glass. Yes, sir. Um, recently, we issued a request for bids for um, sewage sludge removal from our wastewater treatment plant, and that, of course, takes place on an as-needed basis. We purposely did not dictate an ultimate disposal method because we didn't want to exclude um, um, anybody as far as that goes for um, composting facilities or that kind of thing to try to get as broad a, uh, a reach as we could. Um, but no matter what the uh, ultimate disposal would be, there you know, would be a transportation involved uh, to an approved site. Um, most recently they've all been in uh, out-of-state landfills as well. Um, we advertise the bids locally um, on the city's website and in Maryland eMarketplace through April and May of 2018. Those uh, specifications provided for a three-year contract term. We've done that for the probably the last uh, four or five um, contracts that have always been for the three-year term. And uh, the bid form was structured to provide for a, a cost per ton and then we, we provided an estimated tonnage and it's probably within 100 or so um, of, of our historical averages for about 5,500 5, tons per year. Um, that way we'd end up with a, an annual cost and something we could actually um, compare to in uh, apples to apples. But the payments to the contractor will, will be on the cost per ton and then the actual tonnage. So um, it's, there's no estimate with that. We had. Um, modest interest from bidders and attendees at our pre-bid meeting, but uh, um, by uh, the due date, we only had one bid that was turned in that, uh, that met that um, date and time, and that was submitted by uh, Community Refuse Services, LLC, who are a subsidiary of Advanced Disposal Systems Services, I'm sorry, Incorporated. Um, we reviewed that bid package uh, internally and found it to meet our, uh, our service needs as far as that goes. Um, reflective of changes in the industry, the cost per ton for this bid is well in excess of our current contract amount. Um, and if you go to uh, page 181 of your packet, then you'll, the, uh, the listing of the, and I'll go over that, but the, the, the actual bid form is there for um, fiscal year 19. Their bid was $102 per ton, um, and using the estimate of 5,500 tons, um, that's $561,000 a year. For 2020, their bid is $107.10 per ton, or $589,050 per year. And the last year, um, fiscal year 2021, at $112.46 a ton, or $618,530 per year. Uh, the issues with that are that I mentioned that uh, this is well in excess of our uh, budgeted amount. Um, we have, for this uh, fiscal year, 2019, budgeted $400,000 for our sewage sludge removal. Um, because of the, this uh, significant increase in cost, a uh, budget amendment will likely be necessary at a, uh, at a future date. So at this point, uh, staff recommends authorization of the mayor's signature to uh, award the sewage sludge removal contract to Community Refuse of Newburgh, Pennsylvania in the amounts that I just described and, and um, further explained in the bid form on page 181. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Glass. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. So obviously it's a, it's a big jump from what we expected and we've done this before so I, I, would, I would have guessed your estimate would have been pretty close to the, to the cost uh, before seeing this. Um, what, what do you? What, what's your best uh, idea as to what drove, is driving the cost? You know, because I look at it, there's only one person that bid. Do you think this is likely because we just didn't have enough people bid, or is this simply something in the industry that's driving this cost that we can't control? So landfill costs are continuing to go up. They just don't go down. Um, and part of the reason that I think 
um, this cost was higher as um, the parent company is the owner of the landfill and um, where our sludge is going now um, it's a, it was a, a contractor basically that was hauling it to that landfill um, with the uh, the uh, need for a performance bond we had to go with someone who obviously could pr provide that performance bond and, and this company could do that where we had issues with that with the uh, the current company. Mr. Uh, are you done, Mr. Mayor? I'm done. Uh, Dr. Thank you, Mr. President. So, uh, to come back to the price, and, and you said you left the bidding open broad, right? You didn't want to... Purposefully. You know, pur purposely. Um, are there, uh, to your knowledge, are there price differences between companies that... So, landfill prices are going up. Right. So, is there pri are there price differences between companies that that say do take it to the landfill versus something like Syngro or some other organization that might turn it into biosolids? So, um, in a, the instance of Syngro, that um, our, our sludge is dewatered, but it's not pelletized. It's not in a form that because uh, Syngro <coughs> does that work as well. They ship a lot of uh, of their material to uh, to Florida and they put it on orange groves for mm -hmm. the fertilizer value. Um, our sludge is not in that um, state yet. It would need further treatment in order for that to happen. Our sludge could be land, or not landfilled, uh, it could be landfilled as well, but it could be um, windrowed in compost. That would be um, a, another further treatment step, but um, it would be in, in, a, in a consistency where you could do that with it as well. So the sludge that we're producing right now, the sewage treatment plant, is not any kind that a biosolid facility would be interested in? Um, it needs further treatment in order to be able to market it, and that's where the cost then increases. So we would have to absorb that cost? That's correct. Right. So j just to take it one step further, um, when we do our ENR process, we will be pelletizing and dewatering, dewatering and drying and, and pelletizing our own uh, sludge at that point. And, and it will go to be uh, used as a fuel source then. So we that, uh, Lehigh currently that's correct. has some of their biosolids from Cinebro, so. That's correct. Okay. So Mr. President. Mr. Crouch, so th that actually answered one of my questions was about pelletizing mm -hmm. and figuring out how we can make it more marketable. It's a three year contract. We're gonna be hemmed into this for three years, correct? So, um, the answer there is yes and no. Here's why. Um, if we can come up with something in the interim that would be more economic, um, economically um, feasible for us, this is on an as-needed basis. So when I call them, they show. If I don't need them. Okay. So then that, that's, that's, that's good because. We uh, did that purposefully too. Obviously, it's 161000 extra dollars on top of what we've already assumed it was going to be and that's only year one year two and three out you have uh, with it where we still i don't know if mr palmer's not in here um do you know ballpark wise what we were projecting out for that in the waterfront or i guess it would be the sewer fund was again it the same uh, yes about four hundred thousand. that's correct so we're then we're well we're pushing 600k maybe seven actually probably seven hundred thousand in just the gap between what we are building into our rate scale model, correct, yep. um, versus what this is going to cost us. We're talking about a significant amount of money. That's correct. That's going to have an impact on our rates over and above probably what we're already talking about. Is that could accurate? Be. It could be. That's, yes, sir. Yeah, that's a problem. That's bad. Um, we are contemplating or going to part as part of the NR project begin pelletizing the solids. That's correct. W what's keeping us from doing that sooner? Um, the construction schedule. Um, you know, you have to start at A before you can go to B. So it's not a piece of equipment that you purchase that does whole, that function. It's, it's a, a facility, not just a building. machine. That's correct. And, and while it's early in the construction schedule, you, we still have to construct it. Do you have a sense of what the percentage of the cost that we're talking about is for the landfill fees versus the hauling and getting it to where it needs to go, picking it up and dumping it and all that stuff? So that's 
another angle that we could use. We have, we Do have, have we do have a dump truck of our own right. that would meet these uh, the specifications that the state. Well, hell, for three quarters of a million dollars, we could buy a yes. pretty big truck. Yes. Still, so um, the uh, right now we're paying sixty-five dollars a ton, and the lowest bid obviously was a hundred and two. Um, their landfill costs, if we take it to the chambers, that's the other problem is it's the same owner that owns the landfill that we would be calling to. So, And then the only landfill within a reasonable distance that will take the it? the closest landfill, yes. So that's kind of the, that's the, the problem for us there. Um, Northern Landfill is not interested in taking as much sludge as we would uh, provide to them. That's an issue for them as well. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, we, we would uh, probably in the, because right now landfills cost, even at Northern, is, is we pay $65 a ton there for anything that we take to the landfill. So um, we're probably going to be along that line hauling it to, uh, to Chambersburg then, if we haul it ourselves. So, you know, we might be able to save 30 bucks a ton maybe. Have you looked at that to see what the potential cost might be of, granted it's going to take manpower to do it and so we're, it fuel and, we'll, and wear and tear yes, and all that. So we're in the process of that right now to okay. try to get an idea. Part of that um, also is that um, right now our, our uh, materials moved in um, by tractor trailer mm -hmm. and the truck that we have there's going to be a lag time in, the, in the, uh, the logistics of moving it that distance and having the truck back again because it's a mm -hmm. not 24 hour process but it's we move a lot of material. I, I understood, but uh, again, I think, you know, this is a million and a half dollars worth of total cost. If you are telling me that a little over half of that is the actual dumping fee, that's seven, eight hundred thousand dollars of push there. Not that I'm trying to take, look, I'm all pro privatizing and not doing things in the, you know, that, that we can send to public uh, businesses, but th this is, way more money than we were anticipating. That's correct. And I, I think we should at least look at that and, and, and see, I mean, even hiring, hiring a guy, buying a truck and running that stuff up there probably is still going to be significantly less expensive than what we're potentially talking about here, I, I, I think. Uh, but I, I could be way off. No, I, I don't think you are. And that's, and again, that's why we're checking into it right now. So I think the saving grace in the contract is on an as-needed basis. Perfect. So, okay. is the uh, I'm sorry. yeah? Just real quick, mm -hmm. uh, what happened to integrated? Is, is that who we use now? Integrated agronom. That's correct. W where? What happened to them? You said there's a surety issue for performance bond requirement um, okay. that they um, had to work through this company. Actually, they will still be our hauler, but um, they're working as a sub to mm -hmm. this company. Yeah. Um, that's correct. Is the, um, the trade off between the next furthest away and the next furthest away, because uh, I, I, landfill fees in Southern Virginia, for example, or in West Virginia, are, are, as I understand, are lower, but it's farther. And so there's also a break even analysis there on transportation costs. And so right now, our, our slides is going to uh, the um, King George facility just below um, um, in Virginia there, just below um, King's Dominion. Yep. That's where it's going right now. At the 65. And that's including transportation. Oh my. Okay. Hmm. Now the light at the end of the tunnel is we will be pelletizing that's correct. in the relatively near future and then hopefully that's going to be a game changer for us. That's right? correct. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So we have the citizens' comments at the end. Oh, we don't okay. usually. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has a question for, for this, if it was possible. Yeah, you can. You can at, at the end, you can just you can bring it up then. You can. Perfect. And we're not too far. No yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Glass. Uh, <laughs> if there's no more questions. Um, let's see. Did we do the motion? No. Second hold on. on this. Well, I guess here's the thing that I would say about making a motion. He doesn't have to call him unless we are in an absolute right. Right. dire situation, but we can't just let this stuff sit. That's correct. We will be calling him until we figure out something different. We absolutely will be calling him. I don't think we're going to have a choice. I mean, this yeah. stuff can't 
Bill Love. That's correct. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Mayor. So there's, there's nothing in the agreement that says that for this particular service, even though it's as is, that they're exclusive? No, sir. Okay, correct. just wanted okay. to. So did we do a motion? And we can terminate. No, we haven't. So I'll go ahead and make a motion, call. Mr. President. But we don't have to terminate. We just don't call. Right. I'll, I'll make a motion to go ahead and accept the bid uh, from. I lost my page. I apologize. Did you say for sewage center? The bid from this company on sludge hauling. I, I can't find the page. Motion. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Questions? Amendments? Deletions? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. We're on to ordinances and resolutions. We have oh, one quick procedural question, Ms. Levan. Since we're leaving the public hearing open, we defer the introduction, or can we introduce while the, while the record's open still? No. Nope. I'm sorry. Apologies. Okay. Okay. Yes. No, you should introduce. Do introduce. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so our first is adoption of resolution 18-06 of the Mayor and Common Council of Westminster, adopting a downtown parking area map in accordance with the provisions of section 164-111 of the city code. Mr. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the item before you uh, is sort of the second act to something done some time ago. Uh, our city code contains provisions that uh, allow the granting of a reduction about 25% for all construction or uses commenced in the downtown parking area after July 1st, 2004. This specifically was created to allow some flexibility, some reduction in the sort of standard parking requirements that could apply anywhere, highway, commercial, et cetera, for our downtown area. That was specifically by code linked to the downtown parking area map that was to be adopted by resolution by the Mayor and Common Council. My search of the records as well as city clerks was not able to find that document. I don't think it was actually adop adopted. So this evening we are proposing a downtown parking area map uh, that is comprised of all the commercial districts along Main Street from uh, sort of the Triangle Pennsylvania Avenue down to Manchester Avenue and the Cross Street being Route 27. So if you look on the map, it's sort of a, a great big sea of, of gold, which is all residential, and in the middle there's Main Street and it's multiple colors that are all the commercial districts. So essentially, the map would highlight all the existing commercial districts, does not include single family districts, and would allow this provision of the code to be utilized. I think as we discussed during the budget, the one of the city's goals is to look at parking, a number of different parking systems, and to try to provide relief and flexibility, and this is offered at this time in order to offer businesses some relief while we plow into the process of looking at the 10 or so various ways that we regularly park. Thank you, Mr. Mackey. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Mackey? I have a vaguely related question. Dr. Pack? may or may not be valid for this, but anyway, thank you for this map, um, because it, it is interesting. How does the city decide where to place its parking meters? Are they within the downtown parking area? That is a good question, and I don't actually know the answer. All those yeah. meters were placed when I came. There are a variety of maps that indicate the locations for meters, and I can certainly take a look at that and, and get back on that. Just from a deep dive on this, I, I do believe it's properties that the city either owns or leases for the purpose of parking. And I do believe they are all roughly within close distance of Main Street and the parking garages, but that's not a comprehensive answer, that's just an anecdotal. Okay. I was just curious because when I saw the map, mm -hmm. Recognizing the streets, some of the streets obviously have metered parking, but other streets that are included in this area do not have metered parking. And so I was wondering if that was some sort of differentiation for being included in this map or not. That, so the existence of meters was not. Occurred long before I came to the city. I, I, Mr. Glass is probably the only one around when those regulations were adopted. I might ask him. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't. The history of parking meters in City of Westminster, Chapter One. <laughs> Chapter one. <laughs> um, gosh, as long as I remember, it was always on on Main Street. I that was they were there before, and I've been here since there. Right. So um, there are some other streets besides Main. We've got them on Court. Well, there's a couple on Anchor yeah. too, and and they seem a little out of odd. Odd yeah. there. Oddly placed. Yeah. So I, I'm just curious. I didn't know. Yeah. You know, with the creation of this map, whether or not this map had 
some bearing on where parking meters may or may not go or and, and I, I actually like that <coughs> that is a good idea that the, the map was just to address businesses that would have needs so it's only reflecting mm -hmm. business and that this map may well be adjusted after time to reflect okay. that mm -hmm. sort of relationship to where meters are it's a good I'm relationship just to study. Mm -hmm. yeah. all right thank you thank you any further questions mr mack make a motion to adopt 1806 mr president second that Motion second. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, next item is adoption of ordinance number 894, an ordinance authorizing the acquisition of real property located on the High Acre Drive for a public person purpose and authorizing the mayor to accept a deed for said property. Ms. Matthews. Thank you. Last fall, the city was approached by Shelter Senior Living about possibly donating a parcel of property to us. The parcel in question is about 1.4 acres in size and it joins Brightview Westminster Ridge, which is a senior living community. Staff evaluated the property and felt that it would be appropriate for future development as a park. Um, as was probably discussed at the last meeting, if acceptance of this donation is authorized by the mayor and council, the property would be conveyed by a no consideration quick claim deed, which would include a restrictive covenant. Uh, in essence, that restrictive covenant would require that the property be used by the city for parkland, recreational facilities, or other community purpose as um, set forth in the city's zoning ordinance. Uh, so for you this evening is consideration of the adoption of ordinance number 894, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Matthews. Any questions from uh, council for Ms. Matthews? Dr. Becker. Okay. Um, thank you. And I'm not, not opposed to the acquisition of this property, but um, the land that they're donating their driveway goes through that? It's adjacent to it. Oh, it's adjacent, adjacent to it? Adjacent. Yes. Oh, okay. It does not go through the property. It's not underneath that yellow star on the map? It looks like on the map. It looks like it goes right there. I don't believe so, no. Oh, okay. All right. That's, that's fine. Then. Thank you. Yeah, I drove over there and looked at it. I, it seemed like it's off to the, if you're looking at the facility right. to the right. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll be, of their driveway, I think. Okay. I think that's right. I think the line is probably just a little generous. The line is just a little generous. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mr. President. Uh, Councilman Cavacci. Ms. Matthews, uh, are there any costs to the city <coughs> in acquiring this property? If so, what are they? And then what would the cost be for us to maintain that property? I assume we have to mow the grass. That's correct. Uh, uh, there is no cost to the city um, in terms of actually accepting the donation. We need to um, provide a property donation letter similar mm -hmm. to what happened with Wakefield. Mm -hmm. um, the only initial cost to the city would be maintaining the property, mowing. We did attempt to work out an arrangement um, to see if the Brightview folks would be kind enough to mow the property, and I was unsuccessful mm -hmm. in that effort. Um, so that's part of the reason we've heard of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, there would be some initial mowing cost. And uh, talking to Ms. Gruber, our hope would be to uh, secure grant funding in the future to actually develop um, kind of a trail system through the property or some other use that we would bring before the mayor and council in the future. Wait, how many acres is it? It's 1.4. So that's a relatively quick mow with even a medium-sized piece of equipment. Thank you. Any further questions from Ms. Matthews? Can I make a motion? To make a motion to um, adopt ordinance number uh, 894. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Last item is introduction of ordinance number 895, an ordinance regarding local zoning map amendment number LMA 18-01, approving an application for the establishment of a medical cannabis overlay district upon certain property located in the city's B business zone and adopting the accompanying written decision, Mr. Mackey. Before or after we introduce? After you introduce. Okay. Just All right. Mr. President, I'll make a motion to introduce ordinance number 895. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I just closed yep. my packet time state. Yep. 
I'll second that. Motion and a second. Uh, any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. President, I'll make a motion to continue the hearing until our next council meeting. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Any discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. We have no unfinished business. We have one item of new business. Uh, a vote to go into executive session. Dr. Becker? Yes, Mr. President, um, I'd like to make a motion to, um, under uh, Maryland Code Annotated General Provisions Article 3-305B, uh, to move into executive session to consider the acquisition of real property for public purpose and matters directly related thereto, to consult, uh, sorry, to consider the marketing of public securities oh. and The oh, to consider the acquisition of real property for a public purpose, purpose and matters directly related here too, to consult with legal counsel to obtain legal advice on a legal matter. Thank you, Dr. Becker. A motion? Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we're on to departmental reports. Ms. Matthews. She's falling. Well, I, I will defer as Councilperson Kavachi has already covered my points for the evening, but thank <laughs> Sorry. you. Sorry. Quite all right, sir. Sure. Ms. Balancisi. Good evening. Um, so we're, I guess, relatively busy uh, in, with the housing services. We have our rental housing license renewal applications and letters going out um, this Friday. We're mailing them out and hoping to um, get the majority of the rental properties paying their applications in the month of July and being able to issue the licenses. Um, and Excuse me, Ms. Matthews, do we do that just at one time a year? Yes. Or is that, that's not spread out throughout the course of the year, it's done all at once? <coughs> so we send the renewals out uh, once a year and then if someone new were to purchase a property. During through the course of the year. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Um, and the other uh, we're busy, uh, Mr. Singer, Roy Singer, the code enforcement officer, he's very busy and sure. <laughs> grass is growing and the weeds are high and he is, so he's relatively busy with that and housing is moving along in the same direction. That's about it. Mr. Glass. Well, just a few things. The uh, annual paving contract is uh, complete as of last Friday. It kind of turned into a nail biter with all the uh, rain that we've had that uh, um, kind of delayed us. This uh, project had to be done before the end of the fiscal year and um, pleased to say that, uh, that we were able to uh, complete that. Um, so talking about that, the uh, fiscal year 19 contract is out to bid as we speak. So no sooner will we end the last one, we'll start the next one very shortly now hopefully. The Little Pipe Creek relocating and, and lining project um, has been the pre-application for that has been submitted by our uh, design engineer to the Army Corps of Engineers for their review, and um, probably within the next three or four months, we'll we'll have some kind of feedback back from the uh, Army Corps about that uh, that project and and the potential permitting for it. Uh, the last thing is uh, the uh, fiber phases three and four. We're well underway. I don't know. Maybe you noticed the control structure that's been mm -hmm. installed down here. Um, that will handle everything on this side of, uh, of, of 27, basically, for the rest of, of town. <coughs> um, and it's going quite well. We're following the plan to light the sections as, as they are built, as Dr. Wack is, uh, now has services. So um, we had a, a few bottlenecks that, uh, that we had to work through, but uh, um, we're working through them. And um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel to, uh, to get through those as well. So that's all I had, unless there are questions. Where are we at with Medford Quarry? So um, we had met with uh, the county and I met with uh, with MDE um, almost a month ago, I guess at this point, and um, it was a very successful meeting. Um, the the math behind and science behind that meeting was that there is some water available there. Um, since that time, there have been uh, some email chain back and forth where. Um, MDE has now um, taken that under a, an independent review to, um, um, I guess, confirm those numbers, and that's pretty much where we stand right now. They asked for a little bit additional information, 
Um, I think in a more formal note, because uh, it had already been provided to them at, at the, uh, the initial meeting, but um, I think probably we'll hear something back in the next two or three weeks from uh, the conclusion of that. Thank you. Well. Mr. Mackey. Thank you. Just want to report out on some of the meetings and things that are occurring. Uh, on Monday, May 21st, uh, your Main Street Manager, Sandy Anderson, facilitated our regular downtown partners meeting at John Street Quarters. Uh, the city has worked very hard to sort of reposition these meetings as meetings among merchants, uh, with merchants. So there were three guest speakers, uh, one from the Enterprise Store, John and Holly Wheatman, to talk about the city's new ambassador initiative, which is something that is uh, in our budget, you all adopted uh, for FY18. It's a, for economic development and to uh, encourage people to become ambassadors for the town and take over. They're being called uh, partners for the city of Westminster. Also, Tam Bay Page from Cultivated discussed social media and retail store planning. It's very well received. And Val from Ting, which is also local here in downtown, talked about crazy fast fiber service coming to downtown. Uh, the next meeting for downtown partners is July 16th. It's uh, Monday at 8 o'clock. There's refreshments at 30 a.m. Expect to hear Bernie Vogel talk about his partnership with McDaniel and sort of how to successfully do that, and that'll be held at the Carroll Arts Center. Uh, your Planning and Zoning Commission on June 14th approved uh, the Kenora parking lot expansion. I know there was some um, incident then as part of that, so that has been approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, some new canopies that are Chick fil A on Maryland 140, and also the proposed plat for Stone Gate Section 2 for 21 more homes. That's be proceeding for the next several years. Um, your Board of Zoning Appeals in July will be looking at, at a, a review. Uh, it's actually an appeal uh, from an administrative decision. So not everything goes well. That was my administrative decision that they're appealing. And also we're taking a look at uh, a change to an existing non-conforming use. It's a small local business that would like to expand on Main, Main Street. Uh, and in order to do that, they have to have their non-conforming use uh, examined. So staff's working with them on that to help, help that through. Um, and I think that is it for this evening. Thank you. Uh, just a few items. I um, just wanted to take this opportunity to publicly express my appreciation to Ms. LeVan. As you know, we finally closed on the uh, 45 West Main property last Monday. It has certainly been an, at sometimes a torturous adventure, but uh, Alyssa was my partner throughout that, and it was nice to finally get that done. I know some of you have mentioned Councilmember Becker being among them, uh, that you might have some interest in a tour of the interior of the building. Um, I'll be reaching out to you all probably tomorrow um, to see who might want to participate in that. And uh, she's not here, Ms. Palmer and Ms. Gruber are both on vacation, but uh, as you know, we had a last minute dispute about items that had been left in the building and Ms. Palmer really did a fantastic job of trying to identify a low cost alternative to get those belongings removed. Um, that process got underway on Monday as we were getting ready to uh, for the mayor to sign the settlement documents, and they finished up on Wednesday, uh, which if you'd ever seen how much stuff was in that building, it was quite an accomplishment. Um, our architect is continuing to work on the conceptual design. I'm hoping to have something for you all fairly soon that we can share with you so you can see, at least as a staff, what we envision in terms of the space layout. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, following up on Councilmember Yingling's comments, um, as you know, we hired a lobbyist to help us sort of advance water reuse with the state. Um, they had a conversation with Secretary Grumble's uh, point person on this issue. His name is uh, Jeff Fretwell. They had a conversation last Wednesday, which they reported went very well. And um, they are working with Mr. Fretwell to schedule a time in July for representatives of the city to meet with Secretary Grumble's to actually get into a little bit more detailed discussion about what reuse options that we have under consideration. So I will keep you posted on that as that advances. Uh, so I think that concludes everyone's report, unless you have any questions. Mr. President, uh, I'd like to echo your appreciation to Ms. LeVan for the work she did with PNC on that negotiation. She did a great job. But I'd also like to compliment you as well, Ms. Matthews. That was, uh, you know, we were all very in involved with that with you. and. I know I was somewhat difficult at times. In terms of <laughs> I would never say that, Councilmember Cavazzi. <laughs> wanted to pay for that building, so I, I wanted to compliment you on a job very well done. I think that that is a acquisition that will benefit the city for a long time to come. And frankly, had we not made that acquisition, I think it would have been a blight 
for a long time to come on downtown. So great job, and uh, you know, very glad we were able to get a conclusion. Good work. All right, thank you. A second. That. All right, no further departmental reports. We're on to citizen comments. If you have a comment uh, about anything we've been discussing, anything else, please raise your hand and identify yourself for the recording secretary. Yes, ma'am. We have you got to <laughs> tell your name and address again. Yeah, Reverend Jones, 347 Fair Avenue. On the matter of the splurge, I don't think I have anything to add because my questions were before making the decision of the approval of the bid and, and suggestions, but I do believe that that is taken care of. So, well, but still, what, 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 what was your input? Well, I you mentioned. Mr. Glass, you mentioned that there was prospective bidding that could have happened, but because of the time and the deadline, only one submitted. I was wondering if there was a way that it could be extended to submit more, to let other people, other contractors submit more, because one contractor could be one, so there's no competition, so they can raise the numbers and the amounts of the prices however they want. So just to be clear, um, there was a uh, ample amount of time for whoever to bid um, whatever they wanted to bid, okay. but only one contractor bid at, at all. So that's when I said by the, the due date and time, we have to have a cutoff someplace, but you know this process started back in April, so um, if we were going to have additional contractors, additional bidders, they, they had ample time to do that. So maybe I, I was not clear in my and I do apologize. No, no, description. That, good question. Because I were kind of my yep. knowledge, so yep. you know I wanted to have them. No, we on always the, on the matter of the um, donation, the land donated. My suggestion will be um, approach Boy Scouts. That could be a service, a uh, project service for the Boy Scouts to help maintain and beautify the city, which true for 20 and others in Carroll County, if you make the boys out, they might be able to help you to come on the land and cut the grass and have it for free. So, yep. And that's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was something else that I had intended to, to discuss at some point. Um, and it had slipped my mind, but during my vacation, I did quite a bit of reading. And um, one of the things, it was about municipalities and developing vibrant communities and economic development. And, and one of the things that was mentioned in this, in this book um, is about community building. And that communities that thrive for a variety of reasons, one of the things they have in common is active efforts around community building where people in the community make an investment in their time and effort you know and they and they, they demonstrate that they care about the community and so that's a perfect example of something like that and I was, it was going to be something i was going to talk about at some point about we got to figure out a way to to get more people working with the police working with parks and rec working with public works cleaning up beautification things like the thing we do with the McDaniel students you know um, anyway all right any other citizen comments all right we are adjourned until the executive session